be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. There is one body and one spirit. There is one Lord in God's cause of us. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Set us free, O God, from the bondage of our sins, and give us the liberty of that abundant life which you have made known to us in your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. O God, you made, made us in your own image, image and love all that you have made. made. Grant that St. Paul's Episcopal Church, with its loving hearts, curious minds, and open doors, may be truly welcoming to all sorts and conditions of people, that all who seek after you may find you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. A reading from the book of Genesis. Joseph was 30 years old when he entered the service of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went through all the land of Egypt. Through the seven plenteous years, the earth had produced abundantly. He gathered up all the food of the seven years there was, when there was plenty in the land of Egypt and stored up food in the cities. He stored up in every city the food from the fields around it. So Joseph stored up grain in such abundance, like sand of the sea, that he stopped measuring it. It was beyond measure. Before the years of famine came, Joseph had two sons, whom Aseneth, daughter of Potipharah, priest of On, bore to him. Joseph named his firstborn Manasseh, for, he said, God has made me forget all my hardships in all my father's house. The second he named Ephraim, for God has made me fruitful in the land of misfortunes. The seven years of plenty that prevailed in the land of Egypt came to an end, and the seven years of famine began to come, just as Joseph had said. There was famine in every country, but throughout the land of Egypt was bread. When all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to the Pharaoh for bread. Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, Go to Joseph. What he says to you, do. And since the famine had spread all over the land, Joseph opened his storehouses and sold to the Egyptians, for the famine was severe in the land of Egypt. Moreover, all the world came to Joseph in Egypt to buy grain, because the famine was severe throughout the world. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us read Psalm 147 in unison. How good it is to sing praises to our God. How pleasant it is to honor him with praise. The Lord reveals Jerusalem, and he gathers the exiles of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He counts the number of the stars and calls them all by their names. Great is our Lord, and 
A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. We therefore set sail from Tros and took a straight course to Samothrace, the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city for some days. On the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate by the river, where we, suppo where we supposed there was a place of prayer, and we sat down and spoke to the woman who had gathered there. A certain woman named Lydia, a worshiper of God, was listening to us. She was from the city of Tyartria and a dealer in purple cloth. The Lord opened her heart to listen eagerly to what was said by Paul. When she and her household were baptized, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come and stay at my home. And she prevailed upon us. The word of the Lord. of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through it. A man was there named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd he could not, because he was short in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him, because he was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and was happy to welcome him. All who saw it began to grumble and said, He has gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. Then Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek out and to save the lost. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. At this time, any children ages four and up who would like to come take part in Children's Chapel are invited to come forward to the base of the steps for the procession downstairs.
the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. God's transformative work and presence is found in some surprising places. We only have to see it and to point it out to others. When Joseph was 30 years old, he entered the service of Pharaoh. Um, of course, Joseph had lived a lot by age 30. I, I hope that you've read the small novella, the chapters in Genesis about Joseph. It's a great story. Uh, my husband Tim and I are pleased to be here at St. Paul's, and we lived here in Manhattan when we were about 30. And I can tell you that Joseph had had a lot more go on in his life than in mine. Uh, if you remember that story, he had a bunch of brothers. He was actually second to youngest, but a young favored child, right? His, his old man dad loved him, gave him a big coat. Uh, his brothers really were jealous, did not like him. They were going to kill him. And then one kind of came to his senses and said, oh, no, let's just sell him, right? So he gets sold to traders. They take him down to Egypt. And then he gets purchased kind of, um, I think, by a corporate farmer, right? A big, a big organization. And the, the, the man's wife who owns this, she's kind of a cougar. And she tries to seduce Joseph. He's innocent, but he gets thrown into prison anyway. There he meets a baker and a bartender, and this gift that he'd had ever since he was a child comes forth. He has the mystical ability to interpret dreams, to know what God is saying through people's dreams. So he does that, and word of it gets to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, has had dreams about fat cows and skinny cows, about strong grain and the lack of grain. And so he brings Joseph in, and Joseph knows what it means. So this is where we pick up Joseph this morning. Um, he has been put kind of at the right hand of Pharaoh. And in that role, he goes and he tours Egypt, and he sees the grain along the, the Nile flourishing. He sees cattle that are doing really well, and he sees God. He understands that God has been sending Pharaoh a message, and he knows what to do, right? To hold back from using up all that grain, to, to get ready for the drought, for the skinny cows that are to come. Um, in this story, the, the famine does unfold, and it reaches not only Egypt, but all the way up to Israel, where his family uh, was from. And his brothers have to, they're starving up there, come down to Egypt. They think he's long dead, probably, right? And there Joseph appears before him. Now, this is like the most dysfunctional family ever, right? We all have families. Most of them are beautiful. Some of them are complicated. Right, but this family really has some issues. But right there, Joseph sees that God is at work. When his brothers stand before him, it takes him a little while to get there, but he is able to say to them, you sold me here out of hatred, but God sent me before you to preserve life. This story shows us God at work in surprising places, in the halls of government, right? We long to see it in our halls of government, don't we? Um, we see it in, the, in a climate crisis, right? That really is what's going on here. We have times of abundance, then terrible drought. 
God's in the mix. We see it in a dysfunctional family. God is there. And, and Joseph's able to speak about it. He's bold enough to say, look, this isn't just all natural stuff. God is here. So then we get to the story of Lydia. On the Sabbath day, Paul, and in the book of Acts, we presume it is Luke. We've got the Gospel of Luke written by Luke, and then everyone agrees that the book of Acts was also written by Luke. And there's this great thing that happens right about here in Acts that it turns from third-person narration to a we voice. And we think that's where Luke enters the story. In classical literature, they did this, right? That, that the, when the narrator is part of the activity, it becomes a we voice. So, so Paul is there with Luke. And we went outside the gate of Philippi by the river where we supposed there was a place of prayer. There they see an artisan a merchant, a woman named Lydia. To Paul and Luke, Lydia is an outsider. For one, she's a pagan. We sort of assume that when they say they go to the river where we think there's a place of prayer, it wasn't a synagogue, right? It wasn't a Jewish temple. It may have been a place where they would pray to the river gods or goddesses. And... Um, there she is with some other women. I mean, she may have just been there doing what she needs to do for her, for her cloth, because I think ink needs water. But there they meet Lydia. They see her, and she sees them. And we're told that she was open. They could tell that Lydia's heart was open to what Paul was sharing about Jesus. They saw God at work in this surprising place of art, of commerce, with people who were different from them. Um, in that marginal place on the edge of the city, they see Lydia and Lydia sees them. And moreover, she sees the risen Jesus that Paul speaks about. And she's so moved that she says, baptize me, right? And then come to my home. Um, Lydia is the first convert of Europe. So any of us who have European background, we are like the great, 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 right? Spiritual grandsons and daughters of Lydia. Well, what about Zacchaeus? As Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through it, Zacchaeus, a rich tax collector, a short in stature tax collector climbs into a tree because he's curious. He wants to see this much acclaimed rabbi, right? This is pretty later in Jesus's ministry. He's heard about him. There he is up in a tree. Jericho was an oasis town. Think spa, right? Think, um, I love Glenwood Springs, Colorado. I don't know where you like to go, but there were springs there. It was nice weather there. And this is the setting. And it's kind of like on a highway or an avenue. So Jesus is coming in to town. And he sees Zacchaeus up in the tree, right? And, Jesus, and uh, Zacchaeus sees him. Now, Jesus doesn't invite Zacchaeus to church. He doesn't say, let's go to synagogue. He looks at him, he says, I'm coming to your house, right? He just invites himself over to Zacchaeus' house. And Zacchaeus, we know, is very wealthy. If you look at archaeological sites, it was probably a big and beautiful villa. I'm thinking, uh, what are they called? Those real housewives of New Jersey kind of vibe, right? So he goes in. That's where Jesus comes. And God is at work. As Zacchaeus listens to Jesus, he feels this corrupt guy as if he is God's beloved. 
Even he is changed from greedy Zacchaeus, corrupt Zacchaeus, to generous Zacchaeus. Knowing he's loved, liberated, he starts giving everything away. He becomes a little like Jesus himself. God is present in that surprising place, and Jesus pointed it out. So where are your surprising places? Um, Where have you seen God at work that wasn't in this beautiful community of love of St. Paul's or here at worship? Where else? It was nice to have time with our two confirmands, uh, those about to be confirmed, and we talked about some places that they like to go and be that aren't home, aren't work, Uh, The French like these places. They've talked about the third realm for centuries. And the word rendezvous means meeting up right in another place, a cafe or a garden. Um, Well, one of our our confirmands loves libraries. He hasn't gotten there as much as he wants lately, but he just loves the library, right? People studying and learning, a place of peace. So that's a third place. Um, Other one loves to be outdoors. Country road, seeing the deer, seeing turkeys even, maybe cross the road with you, pheasants. These are third places, and we need to open our eyes to, to God being there through the creatures, through what people are learning. Um, we need to be able to go into our third places, because that's where Jesus, most of the time, was himself and sends us as his disciples, right? Yes, they were in church. Yes, they were in prayer. But a lot of times, they were just out and about. And when they saw God, when they saw somebody a little like Lydia, whose heart was open, they weren't shy. They would speak about it. I've come to learn that this is really important to me because I came to know God on the ski slopes around Aspen, Colorado. I was an agnostic, I was skiing, and I heard the gospel there and sort of had my first prayer and sense of the creator God. And I would run around soon after that with, uh, I call them renewal Catholics, so teenagers, and they saw how much I loved the creation. They saw my sense of awe with those granite peaks, the meadows, and they were were brave enough to say, Kathleen, look, there's somebody behind all that. There is a God who made it, and you can know that God, that God that created all this, created you and wants to be in relationship. They said, Jesus preaches about this all the time, and look at his parables. They're full of the creation. That changed all my life. So I urge us um, out into the third places. And let us learn um, how to talk the walk, is one of the ways I like to talk about it, is to say, Uh, I think Episcopalians are out. We're not afraid to go out. And we're feeding people through the the cafe. We are out on campus, right? We are hiking the Kanza, studying the prairie. But sometimes we're shy to speak about God. I want to invite everyone to an all-diocesan read. It's going to start in Lent. We're reading a a, a book called Humbler Faith, Bigger God. And there is a preacher, he's out of London, and he takes seriously the critiques in our culture about Christianity, about God even. And each chapter has like one critique, like this is the opiate of the masses, right? And he takes it seriously, doesn't get defensive, and then at the end of each chapter says, how would Christianity be better if we took this seriously, right? 
and he'll, he does all different kinds of, of, of issues. And I hope that we'll read it together. We can do it by Zoom, right? It'll be once a week. You could do it here at the church if you want. And um, hopefully it'll help us both see people's questions and know what to say. So that we're, when we're out in those third places and we see people interested, open to knowing God, uh, we won't be so shy as we go to the, to the liturgy of the table and we ask Jesus himself into us, may we be empowered to see God at work in those places we are. And may he inspire our lips that we can point out God at work to people and know how to speak of the way of love uh, that has touched each of us. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. The candidates will now be presented. I present these persons for confirmation. Each of you together, do you reaffirm your renunciation of evil? Do you renew your commitment to Jesus Christ? To all of you, will you who witness these vows do all in your power to support these two people in their life in Christ? We will. Let us join with those who are committing themselves to Christ and renew our own baptismal covenant. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born in the Virgin Mary. He suffered at the Pontius Pilate, was crucified and died in the grave. He descended to the dead. On the third day, He rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand. Do you believe in God, the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Will you continue in the Apostles' teaching and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in the prayers? I will with God's help. Will you persevere in resisting evil? And whenever you fall into sin, repent and return to the Lord. I will, with God's help. Will you proclaim, by word and example, the good news of God in Christ? I will, with God's help. Will you seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving your neighbor as yourself? I will, with God's help. Will you strive for justice and peace among all people? and respect the dignity of every human being. I will, with God's help. Let us now pray for these persons who have renewed their commitment to Christ. Deliver them, O Lord, from the way of sin and death. Lord, hear our prayer. Open their hearts to your grace and truth. Lord, hear our prayer. Fill them with your holy and life-giving spirit. Lord, hear our prayer. Keep them in the faith and communion of your holy church. Lord, hear our prayer. Teach them to love others in the power of the Spirit. Lord, hear our prayer. Send them into the world in witness to your love. Lord, hear our prayer. 
Bring them to the fullness of your peace and glory. Lord, hear our prayer. Almighty God, we thank you that by the death and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, you have overcome sin and brought us to yourself, and that by the sealing of your Holy Spirit, you have bound us to your service. Renew in these your servants the covenant you made with them at their baptism. Send them forth in the power of that Spirit to perform the service you set before them. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Strengthen, O Lord, your servant Hank with your Holy Spirit. Empower him for your service and sustain him all the days of his life. Amen. Defend, O Lord, your servant Mason with your heavenly grace that he may continue yours forever and daily increase in your Holy Spirit more and more until he comes to your everlasting kingdom. Amen. Almighty and ever-living God, let your fatherly hand ever be over these your servants. Let your Holy Spirit ever be with them, and so lead them in the knowledge and obedience of your word, that they may serve you in this life and dwell with you in the life to come, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Would you now join in welcoming the newest Episcopal Christians and members of St. Paul's Church. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Good morning, and peace be with you. It's so good to see you this morning. A special welcome if you're here for the first time or the first time in a long time. Um, we have visitor cards in the pews in front of you if you'd like to stay in touch or please introduce yourself at the door. It's good to see you here today. Um, let's see. Um, in the back of the church, there are some updated calendars for the spring. All of the Lenten activities, Holy Week services, and also adult education for the spring. So please pick one of these up on your way out. Following this service, Bishop Bascom will be joining us downstairs, leading a forum, talking about some of the priorities of the diocese right now, and also then inviting those who are involved in creation care in any way to stay after that, to talk to her specifically about that. Um, we are delighted to have the bishop and archdeacon and the bishop's husband here with us today. Um, really glad to have you here um, with St. Paul's. Lent is early this year. Easter is early this year. That means we are getting close to Mardi Gras and Ash Wednesday. If you, um, one thing we do every year is we burn the palms from the last Palm Sunday to make ashes for Ash Wednesday. So if you have poems that you would like to contribute to that, please bring them by next Sunday to church. And um, we will have a Mardi Gras party details still to be determined, but on Tuesday night, of, um, that's the 13th of February, and then Ash Wednesday, there are services at 8, 12, and 6 here in the church. 
And then we will be having soup suppers every Thursday in Lent. There is, I believe, a sign-up sheet in the back of the church. Yes. So if you are able to bring soup or bread, yes, <laughs> being, being held up in the back of the church there. If you're able to bring soup or bread and would like to sign up to do that, we'll have a simple meal and then gather for Compline every Thursday in Lent. And following, um, our coffee hour today will be downstairs as um, part of the Bishop's Forum. So please join us downstairs for a great coffee hour following this service. And I think that's it. Does anyone have any blessings or thanksgivings they'd like to share this morning? Okay, Bishop, did you have anything you wanted to add? Thank you, Mother Margaret. Uh, just very briefly to add on what she said about the creation care work. We're building a network of Episcopalians in the Diocese of Kansas who are engaged in endeavors small or large. So urban gardens uh, to cattle ranching, restoring prairie, taking care of wildlife, just loving the Audubon Society or watching birds. So we invite any of you to just stay for a little, it'll be a little while at the very end of things um, so we can share kind of what's going on and learn, learn who you are. Uh, it's also a great privilege of mine to, to welcome, as, as we've been graciously welcomed, to Archdeacon Jeff Roper. When, whenever I travel to our 44 churches in the diocese, one of the archdeacons comes with me, your own, uh, Charles Pierce uh, did it for many, how many years, Charles? Thirteen. Um, so they, they assist the bishop. And uh, Jeff has been doing this about a year and is usually down in the southern part of our diocese, but was willing to come up and be with you all. So, Jeff. Well, welcome. You all have a beautiful church here. Um, it's my first time to, to be in this church, uh, and I hope it's not my last. Um, I just want to share with you that uh, you have a great uh, role model and somebody that's a role model in my life in uh, former Archdeacon Charles Pierce here. Um, I'm currently wearing uh, the Archdeacon stole that, that he was wearing and it's quite an honor to, uh, to be here with you, uh, Charles. And just to say something a little bit about the diaconal ministry, I'm going to keep this shorter than I did uh, earlier service. Um, you know, diaconal ministry is it's similar, but it's different than, than the call of a priest. And um, in the diaconate, there's, there are lay deacons and there are uh, ordained deacons. Um, in either case, if you're a person that, that outreaches something that's important to you, if uh, you, uh, you take to heart Micah 6.8, that our task that God requires of us is to do justice and love kindness and walk humbly before our God, then please listen up and, turn, and listen for God, listen for the Holy Spirit. In what way can you, we serve the most vulnerable in our society? And I know you all are, are doing all of that. And um, when we describe the role of a deacon, in many cases, like with Yvonne here, it's just, we have one foot actually in the world and one in the church that makes us kind of unique in terms of parish ministry, meaning, we're trying to go out there and find, we have a natural curiosity, we understand how can we be of help to this community? How can we serve the greater good? Um, and if that is something that has an appeal to you, um, your task then, if, if you're a deacon, is you come back to the church and say, hey, I've discovered a need, and uh, these folks really need our help. Whoever that might be, that you might be serving and loving. Um, and you share that, and part of what we do is in working collaborative with the priest, a local priest here, figure out who and how are we going to find people from our church to meet that need. If that sounds interesting to you, talk to Yvonne, talk to Mother Margaret or, or Bishop or me. Uh, we'd love to uh, have, help answer any questions you might have about diaconal ministry. Just know you're welcome as a lay or ordained deacon, but we'd love to, to raise up another Yvonne. Okay. Thank you, Archdeacon. Walk in love as Christ loves us and gives himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God.
Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is right, and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. Because in Jesus Christ our Lord, you have received us as your sons and daughters, made us citizens of your kingdom, and given us the Holy Spirit to guide us into all truth. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. When he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper he took the cup of wine and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death and resurrection and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people, the body, and the blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also, that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Oh, <laughs> 
disciples knew the Lord Jesus in the breaking of the bread. The disciples knew the Lord Jesus in the breaking of the bread. The bread which we break, Alleluia, is the communion of the body of Christ. The disciples of the Lord Jesus in the breaking of the bread. One body are we. Alleluia. For though many we share one bread. The disciples to the Lord Jesus in the breaking of the bread. The gifts of God for the people of God.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now to the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. And I wanted to say what a blessing it was to have our first reader this morning, <laughs> who read so well. And I wanted to give a shout out to my husband, Tim, um, for the blessing of when he comes and travels with me. And also his family has roots here for a couple of generations. And uh, it's a blessing to kind of call Manhattan home due to the peace of God, which surpasses all of our human understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in the knowledge and the love of God and of God's Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen.